So that's the, the, the sort of overview. Now let me get into the specifics and how did we actually discover these uh, family of proteins. And it will be interesting for you to see how science uh, in this field evolved. Now, as is often the case uh, when you first try to tackle a very complex problem, and of course we didn't really know how complex it was when we began these studies, but we assumed it might be complicated. It certainly would be more complicated than uh, systems that we had already had some idea about, for example, in, uh, in bacteria or in bacteriophages. So we took a lesson from our studies of bacteriophages and decided that to begin to dissect the molecular complexities of the transcription process in animal cells, we should start with viruses. Because we knew that viruses will enter these host cells, these complex cells that we ultimately want to study, uh, and have to use the same molecular machinery to transcribe their genes uh, as the host uh, mammalian cell would do. So this was kind of a trick or a, a way to look at a molecular window into a complex system and try to simplify it. And in our case, uh, the early studies uh, of the late 70s and early 80s involved a very simple, one of the simplest double-stranded DNA viruses called simian virus 40. And simian virus 40, of course, is a monkey virus, which was nice because it's very close to humans. Uh, and many things that we could learn about the way this virus uses its host, which are monkey cells, to replicate and to express their RNAs and genes uh, would be applicable to our uh, studies of humans, as you'll see. And this virus uh, was one of the first whose DNA, its double-stranded DNA of about 5,000 base pairs, uh, was fully sequenced. This was long before rapid modern-day sequencing was available. So this gave us a very powerful tool. It basically allowed us to look at the entire genome of this virus, which was tiny by comparison, only 5,243 base pairs. But just that information was already very important because it very quickly allowed us, for example, to map where the genes are. And one of the genes encoded a protein called the tumor antigen, which turns out to be a transcription factor. This then allowed us to get our hands, basically to do biochemistry and genetics, on the very first eukaryotic transcription factor, which in this case happens to be a repressor. That is, a protein that when it binds to DNA, just the same way as I showed you for the, uh, the model case, uh, it binds through specific protein DNA interactions, but in this case actually shuts transcription down rather than turn it up. In the process of studying the way that this little virus, when it infects a mammalian cell, uses proteins like T antigen to regulate its gene expression, uh, it became clear that it had to use the host machinery to, to do the process. And that meant that there must be monkey proteins that are also involved in activating or repressing genes of this virus. And this then led us to the most important step, which is to transfer the technology we learned about viruses and how to work with the virus transcription factor like T antigen to the cellular ones. And I'm going to give you just one example of how this simple jump into the host cell allowed us to discover the first human transcription factor. So the, the question that we then asked uh, back in the early 1980s was, what host molecule uh, is regulating the expression of transcription of this virus uh, when the virus is in the host? And we knew from the DNA sequence of the virus that there were these six very GC-rich snippets of DNA that were regulatory, because if we deleted them, the virus no longer would express the gene of interest. So we knew that something was probably responsible for recognizing these GC boxes, uh, and we knew that it wasn't a virally encoded gene, because we had tested all of the viral genes, of which there were only six to begin with. So we knew it had to be a host gene, and that led us to uh, a whole, I would say, family of experiments that led to the discovery of sequence-specific mammalian transcription factors. And as I said, we could have taken multiple approaches to try to address this uh, complicated issue. Uh, I'll just give you one example uh, of using in vitro biochemistry to finally get our hands on this key sequence-specific human transcription factor, which of course has a, uh, a, a homolog in the monkey.
And the way we did it was, uh, w was very interesting and simple in retrospect. And that is recognizing the fact that whatever uh, this protein was, it had to have the property of recognizing those GC boxes that were sitting next to the, uh, the viral gene. We assumed that it must be a sequence-specific DNA binding protein. So all we had to do is figure out a, a way to extract proteins from human cells or monkey cells and then try to fish out uh, those specific proteins out of the many thousands of different proteins that were in this gamish of cellular extract that would be responsible for discriminating between random DNA sequences and the specific GC box. And I'll quickly run through sort of the logic behind this. So what I'm showing you here is a solid uh, surface with DNA coupled to it that is highly enriched for the recognition element, the GC box, which should be the, the sequence recognized by the protein of interest. Now, we had no idea what this protein was going to look like, how many proteins there were going to be, and so forth. But we knew it had to recognize the GC box. So we're going to try to fish this out of a, a pool of uh, many thousands of other proteins. Now, the, the key trick here was that because all cell extracts contain not only one DNA binding protein, but as I told you, thousands of different DNA binding proteins, but most of them, or in fact in our case, none of the other uh, of several hundred to a thousand proteins that could bind DNA actually happen to recognize the GC box. They just bind other DNA sequences. So to kind of favor our protein being able to bind to our GC box and not have to compete with all the other proteins, what we did was to add nonspecific DNA in mass stoichiometric act excess so that all the other proteins that wouldn't recognize the GC box would still have some partner to hang on to. And this trick worked very well. So having the specific DNA on the solid resin and the nonspecific DNA flowing all over the place, we could, only, we could capture selectively the pink molecules here, which are the GC box recognition ones, and the uh, blue-green molecules, of course, predominantly bind to nonspecific DNA. I show you one little blue one in the, on the column because nothing works perfectly in real science and tells you that we have to go through this process iteratively to actually uh, finally obtain a preparation that's purely pink molecules with no green-blue ones. Well, that turned out to work very, very well. And that whole process of biochemical fractionation followed by a, a direct affinity sequence-specific DNA resin uh, gave us the ability to perform a biochemical purification followed by a molecular cloning of the transcription factor that encodes uh, the protein SP1. And then we carried out a bunch of experiments, which I'll tell you next, to show that this protein actually does activate transcription. Uh, and of course, we went back and we proved that this protein, which turned out to be a rather large polypeptide, can indeed recognize the GC box. And it doesn't matter if it's a GC box from the SP40 genome or any other GC box that we could find in the human genome. Uh, it would find that sequence and bind to it. Uh, and then it would uh, generally activate transcription. So this led to the discovery of the first of uh, a very large family of sequence-specific DNA binding proteins. Now, I told you that the way these proteins tend to recognize short DNA sequences is to interact with DNA through the major group. And here's a perfect example. So the stick blue model there shows the actual three structures that are called zinc fingers. And the reason they're called zinc fingers is because they're amino acids that are uh, organized around a center that contains a zinc molecule, which holds the three-dimensional shape of the polypeptide in a position uh, just right for fitting into the major groove of the DNA. And the DNA here is shown in pink. And you can see that that blue outline fits right into the major groove of the DNA, but not to the minor groove. And one of the most important findings was not only the discovery of the first human transcription factor, but the realization that most, if not all, sequence-specific DNA binding transcription factors have a similar structural motif. That is to say, some structure is built to recognize sequences in the major group of DNA. And these three-dimensional motifs uh, are recognizable as amino acid sequences in the genome. So we can now 
much more quickly scan the entire sequence of a genome and identify genes that are likely to be DNA binding proteins as a result of understanding the structure function relationships of these DNA binding motifs like zinc fingers.